I'm Steve, says there, Steve Hicks. On Twitter, I'm at ppopowitz, that's P-E-P-O-P-O-W-I-T-Z. You know where the name comes from. I'd love to talk to you about that show. Email, you can reach me at steven.j.hicks at gmail.com if you want to. And uh, before anybody asks, yes, these slides are on the internet, and in fact, they're already there. Um, there's a URL there, stevenhicks.me slash react dash testing, uh, and it will be at the footer of every slide, pretty much. I wanna thank all of you for being here. 10.30 this morning, I think, is the toughest time slot uh, there is in this conference. I looked at the schedule, and there were like five that I wanted to go to. So thanks for picking me, I appreciate it. I wanna thank the organizers. This is my second year speaking at that conference. Um, and like I said, I help out with a conference and it's a ton of work. So if you see anybody in a blue shirt, thank them. If you see Clark, give him a high five. Thank them for all the work that they do to make this stuff happen. Sponsors too. Uh, Clark kind of alluded to this. I don't know if he totally spelled it out, but there's basically two sources of, two sources of, of income for a conference. You, people, or your company, and then the sponsors. So we have to thank all of them and go out and talk to them and, and make sure you let them know that you appreciate them being here and making this conference happen. So I am standing right in front of you. Uh, you can see what I look like on the left. However, is what my daughter Olivia thinks I look like. She's seven. And on the right is what my daughter Lila thinks I look like. She's 10. Um, and if you think this is just an excuse to talk about my kids and show their artwork, you're correct. I am a JavaScript engineer. I work for a company in Milwaukee that you might have heard of. We're called Northwestern Mutual. <laughs> might be some more of you in here. Uh, if you're looking for work, we're always hiring. Um, we don't really do remote, Milwaukee area. I think it's cool because it's like, you get big company perks, you get to work in this beautiful tower where this is the view like 10 feet away from my desk. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but then you also get to use small company tech. You know, we're all doing, not all of us, but a lot of us are doing Node.js and React and a bunch of fun JavaScript things. We also have a booth, which I think is in the middle-ish, but I get super disoriented when I try to get out in that hallway. So uh, come find me out there, come find other people out there, talk to us, hang out. You can win a 4K monitor, which is a pretty awesome prize. One thing you should know about me is that I really enjoy writing tests, uh, to the point that if I'm in a stand-up and somebody says, yeah, I've been working on this feature and I've almost got it done, um, but I still just need to write the test for it, I'll raise my hand and I'll be like, okay, I'll write the test for you. Uh, I just, I get enjoyment out of that because I feel like I can get close to the code that I don't know. I get to learn it, I get a feel for what all this stuff is gonna do. And maybe do some refactoring, write some tests, make everybody feel good about it. That's me, um, but let's talk about you. Uh, developers, React devs in the room, raise your hand. Should be most of you, okay, cool. Uh, those of you who don't do React, we're gonna be looking at something called JSX, which to some people makes them wanna throw up. Um, to others, I think it's the greatest invention in development uh, in the last five years. <clears throat> How about people who have very little testing experience, uh, like automated testing, writing unit tests, that kind of thing? Okay, so a few. And then um, you're familiar with testing, but you've never written tests in React. That's a good amount of people. Uh, and how, how many of you are already writing React tests today? Nice, that's a good amount. All right, so uh, we're, the talk is kind of built in, broken into a couple different sections and we'll do some beginner level stuff and then we'll get into some more, um, some more best practices and things like that. This is the testing pyramid. You might have seen it before. If you haven't, it's an idea put forth by a person whose name I don't remember. Um, but basically it suggests that there's three different types of tests that you should use to cover your app. You should write unit tests, and those are testing little tiny pieces. Um, so this little component or this little function works right here in isolation. You should write integration tests, which is starting to combine all those unit tests together and make sure that they play nicely. And then you should write UI tests, uh, which is basically firing up your app and clicking through it and making sure that it does what it's supposed to do. And it's shaped like a pyramid, 
because it suggests that there's a balance to the amount of tests that you should write. There's a trade-off. The ones at the bottom, the unit tests, they're really, really easy to write, and they run really fast. They don't cost very much to maintain, because uh, you can just go change stuff here and there. But they don't give you very much confidence that your system works. They give you confidence that units work. Integration tests is, are kind of in the middle of there. But the UI tests give you all the confidence that your app is functioning correctly, because you're actually clicking through the app and doing the things that you're supposed to be doing and making sure that they work. But they're super expensive to write and to maintain. So the pyramid suggests, well, write lots of the ones that are easy to write and maintain, uh, and then write some at the top that are not as easy to maintain. But you've got to do it, because if you don't, you're not going to be sure that your, your app is working. And there are some people who don't like the shape of the test pyramid. They say, well, it should be more like all the tests should be integration, and there's some UI tests and just a couple of, of unit tests and um, some other shapes that people argue for. I like the pyramid. I think it's pretty accurate. Uh, I find that um, it does a good job of describing what I want to do in my app. This talk is going to focus mostly on this half of the pyramid. We'll be talking about unit tests and some integration tests. And when I say integration tests, it's like integration tests between some of your components. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be writing UI tests. It just means that the things that we're going to talk about in here uh, aren't really going to be covered, aren't really going to cover UI tests. There's very different strategies that you're going to use to write your UI tests versus the unit test. This is what our journey looks like today. I'm going to arm you with tools, get you started. And then we're going to talk about how to actually go about testing our React app. And then we're going to do some guidance, some good practices. These are the things that will help you keep your tests alive for longer. If you're like me, you fell asleep on your couch when you were seven years old and rolled onto your whatchamacallit candy bar and the wrapper and woke up two hours later and it was melted and disgusting and you were really, really mad at it. So mad, in fact, that you still remember it at the age of 41. Uh, that's the same couch that you would have spent a lot of your childhood sitting on and watching The Price is Right. Any Price is Right fans? All you, yes, all right. And if you were like me, all you were doing when you were watching The Price is Right was waiting for this game to come on. This is the, it's kind of like the cliffhangers game where this guy's gonna climb the mountain because the music that goes along with it was so good. And those of you who don't know the music, it's right here if it plays. All right, so our little man is going to climb the mountain throughout the talk, and he's going to, he's going to guide us up this hill. Getting started, we're going to talk about Jest. Jest is a test framework uh, that I'm especially interested in. There's a lot of JavaScript test frameworks out there. Jest, I think, is the, the, the best one, in my opinion, for several reasons. For starters, it's really easy to set up. If you're using Create React App, it's already set up for you. Um, is anybody using something other than Create React App to start apps when they build their, their React apps? Other boilerplates or anything like that? Uh, if you're using something else, it's probably maybe a couple steps to just uh, get things set up. If you follow the conventions for naming your files with Jest, Jest is just going to find them. You don't have to worry about firing up globtester.com to go figure out why it can't pick up these files that you swear should be covered by the tests. It just finds them for you. It's pretty awesome. Jest ships with this interactive watch mode that out of the box will run only the tests that are affected by the changes since your last commit. So this makes it seem like it's running really fast, because even though your test suite is like 1,000 tests or 100 tests or whatever it is, you're only running the, the number of tests that are specifically associated with the code that you're writing right now. This is super great for test-driven development if you're doing something like that. You can also uh, run all tests. Uh, that's a good thing to do before you commit and push. You can tell it to filter by name or file path. One of my favorite things that's happening in um, development right now is that DevTools are getting really good at giving us helpful error messages. Rachel, this one's for you. Rachel spent a lot of time yesterday talking about error messages and how uh, if you don't tell the user how to fix the problem, they won't ever figure out how to fix the problem. And so Jest, I think, does a good job of, of telling me as a developer uh, 
not just if something went wrong, but what went wrong and gives me some, some ideas about how to fix it and it helps me pinpoint how I can go about fixing the problem. This is an example of an error message that you would get from the failing test in Jest. And it's, uh, I imagine, pretty hard to read in the back, so I'm gonna read through the things that are important. Um, at the top, it just kinda tells me the name of the test that's failing. It's uh, mapsbeers.spec.js, and it tells me the test that's failing. And then it tells me kind of the difference between the two items. But then in the, at the bottom, in the red box, is a diff of the object, which is really helpful. So in this case, I can see that my expected object was supposed to get a name property, but my actual object got a Cerveza name property. And this is just helpful because now it's a lot easier to read that, and I can go figure out how do I fix this? Well, I gotta deal with the, the name property. Something changed there. Just also includes a feature called snapshot testing. And snapshot testing um, is basically the ability to take a component, render it, and compare it to what it rendered the last time. We're gonna talk about this more later in more detail, uh, but this is a feature that a lot of people are really excited about uh, in React Dev and with Jest. Installing Jest, is, like I mentioned, is, is pretty simple. It's probably as simple as doing this if you don't already have it. It's just installing uh, the Jest dependency and not a lot more. Uh, you might need to do some stuff for Babel um, and uh, maybe a little bit of Webpack specific stuff, but those things are very well covered in the docs. So if you go there, you'll get a good walkthrough of how to solve those problems. There aren't very many problems that you have to figure out. I mentioned that Jest has conventions. You can put your files in one of three places. You can put them in a tests folder, underscore, underscore, tests, underscore, underscore folder. You can put them in files named something.spec.js. And you can put them in files named .test.js. You pick, they all will work just fine. I don't like underscore, underscore, tests, underscore, underscore, because I can't say it out loud. It's hard to pronounce all those underscores. Uh, I choose spec, and I don't really have a good reason for it other than that's how I've named my files for a while, and I like it. The Jest API is pretty slim. It starts with uh, the describe function, and describe is how you define a set of tests. It's a little bit like namespacing your tests. If I were going to test a function called get local beers, I would write a, a describe function, and the first argument would be what the thing is that I'm testing it. It's a string, and I can give it whatever arbitrary name I, I want to, but that name is going to come back to you in the error messages when your tests are failing. So it should be something that leads you to the right place. The second argument is a function, and that function is basically where you're gonna put your tests. One of the things that I like about describe is that you can nest it, and I think this is useful for describing scenarios in your tests. I can describe the get local beers function, I'm testing that thing, but maybe I have four or five tests that I wanna write that all have something to do with um, when there are lots of beers. I can just put a second describe block in there and it helps me keep my tests organized. And again, I would put all of the when there are lots of beers tests inside of that inner function. When you want to write an actual test, you'll use it or test. They both do the exact same thing. The reason they both exist is because Jest wants to be accommodating to people coming from lots of different frameworks. And some other frameworks use tests, some other frameworks use it, it ends up being just what is your personal preference, what, is, what flows out of your fingers the, the quickest. I like to use it because I feel like my tests read like a sentence. So here's an example of how I would write a test. It calls the API. Again, uh, the first argument to it is a string, and the significance to that string is that's what's gonna show up in the message when the test fails. So I want it to be helpful for me. Second argument is a f another function, and it is basically where all of your test code goes. Inside of your tests, you're gonna wanna make assertions. Assertions are how you tell if things are true or false, if this value is correct. 
And this is just a small sample of the assertions that you get out of Jest. Jest calls them matchers. Uh, I call them assertions because I think that's, that makes more sense. Uh, but here's a few you can do. Um, all of them start with the expect function. So you call expect, give it a thing that you want to compare, and then uh, you open up a whole bunch of functions or methods that you can execute to compare it to something else. So in this case, I might be expecting result.location, which is a string, to equal another string. Uh, I might expect result.name, also a string, not to equal a string. I might expect result.beers, which is an array, to have length of three, or any arbitrary length. Or you can be a little bit more general with your array comparisons. I might expect this result.beers array to contain a specific item instead of being fully uh, all the items in that array. And that, is, that last one is really nice for, for doing things where uh, you want to write tests that aren't going to break when you change something that's not related to that test, because you're only looking for one specific item in the array, not comparing the entire array. If you're convinced, there's a tool called Jest Code Mods that you can use to convert all of your existing tests to Jest. And um, it, it isn't totally trivial. It's not a total, totally trivial experience. You might have to go in and change, do some global search and replace to change some of the ways that you wrote your existing tests so that just code mods will be able to pick up those tests. Uh, but as an example, I converted 3,000, I think 3,300 tests that were written in tape to just, and it took me about maybe a two hours to get that done. I had to go through and just do a little bit of global search and replace to get them in the right shape, and then Jess Code Mods picked up and ran with it. OK. So we're going to be using Jest as a foundation for all the tests that we look at. And now we're going to talk about how to actually go about testing our React app. And it starts with testing your business logic. It's one of the most important things to test in your app because it's the difference between collecting a 5% surcharge and a 0.5% surcharge, and that's a lot of money. So you absolutely, if you have business, lo business logic in your app, should be testing it. The good news is it's also one of the easiest things to test because they're generally just functions. They don't have a whole lot of other things to go with them. Here's an example of some business logic I might test. Uh, maybe I've got this function. In this case, it's called filter beers. That's the test we're, or the function we're testing. And filter beers is going to take some beers, and I want to make sure that it gives me back the right ones. Just doing some filtering. In this case, I'm filtering, um, filtering out everything that isn't a porter because porters are objectively the best beer that there is. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah. I, I'm thinking about porters now. That's, I totally distracted myself. <laughs> uh, so here's, here's my test. It filters out beers that aren't porters. And I start with a beers array. One of them is a porter, one is not a porter. I call my function that I'm testing, filter beers. I pass it those beers. And I just write a simple, a couple of assertions. Expect result to have length one, because I should only get one of them back. And expect the first result.name to equal mud puppy porter. That's business logic, and we can move on to components. This is probably what we're most looking forward to, right? We're going to talk about testing React components, uh, but we're going to take a step back. We're not going to get there, because when you're testing components, I think it's really important to ask yourself, are you sure that what you're about to test in this component can't be extracted into another function? And then that function be tested in isolation. <coughs> This is especially useful when you're doing things like mapping functions. Like one of the things that I do all the time is I get an object from an API in one shape, and I need to change it to a different shape to display it the way that I want to display it. And that type of function can totally be extracted from your component into a function that's just named, in this case, map API beer to UI beer. So here's my test. It maps API beers to UI beers. I see my API beer is, uh, it has a beer name and a beer ID property, and then my UI beer has just beer and just ID properties. Now I call map API beer to UI beer, and I pass it API beer. I get a result back, 
Now I can expect my result to equal the expected UI beer. It looks a lot like the test that we looked at before. It's kind of like a business logic test. It's a, it's a test of a pure function where I give it some inputs and I get some outputs back and it's the same outputs when I give it the same in inputs every time. But if it can't be extracted and you actually do want to test your component, I've found that there are really two places that I really want to test my components. Two things I want to test about them. First of all, does it render properly? When I render this component, do I see this div? And then does it interact properly? When I click on this button, does this other div show up? For both of these things, we're going to be using a tool called Enzyme. Um, and Enzyme describes itself as this. Enzyme is a JavaScript testing utility for React that makes it easier to assert, manipulate, and traverse your React component's output. What it really means is you can render your components into memory and then uh, do comparisons with those components and, and traverse them to find things and uh, look for specific elements uh, to make sure that things are rendering properly. The main selling points for me for Enzyme, it has a really intuitive API. Uh, it's similar to jQuery's API. Um, is anybody in here actively doing jQuery development? One. So different than what it would have been even five years ago. Um, and I don't think, I, I mean, do you enjoy doing jQuery development or would you rather be doing other stuff? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, uh, jQuery. I don't. I don't think there's a lot of people who would be interested in doing jQuery development right now. But you can't argue that they did an amazing job at defining an API that we still use today in a lot of different places for traversing our elements. Enzyme uses that, so it looks a lot like you're going through the document with jQuery. You can also choose with Enzyme if you're going to render things sh in a shallow method or, or deeply, meaning do I want to render this component in isolation or do I want to render it with its entire component tree? And this allows you to make decisions like this is a component that I want to test uh, in a totally isolated manner as a unit test, or this is a component that I want to test with the entire tree because all these things need to play nicely together. Installation for Enzyme is not as easy as Jest. Um, so for this one, I just recommend going to the docs for that one right away. There's a couple steps like installing adapters, which I always forget. Uh, they, it's just easier to follow along with their example if you're going to install it. To demonstrate the first part of testing components, which is render, I have a scenario of components for you. We have a top level beer component. And that beer component has two children, a brewery and a beer style. When I use the shallow helper from Enzyme, this is what's going to get rendered. The beer, that's it. The children aren't going to be rendered at all. There's another helper from Enzyme called render, which will render the entire tree. So not only the beer, but also the brewery and the beer style. Uh, and it will give you basically static HTML that you can traverse. If you want to interact with things, you can't do it with render. You can look, you can inspect the, the shape of it and make sure it rendered correctly, but you can't go back and click on buttons in your test. If you wanted to do that, you would be using the mount helper. And mount uh, renders the entire tree, but it renders it basically to a fake DOM. It's called JS DOM. Uh, it's as close to the browser as you're going to get with your tests, as opposed to actually pulling your code up in a browser. The code for these components might look like this. I have, uh, I'm importing brewery and, and beer style for my, uh, my beer component. Does the import stuff look c funny, or does anybody need an explainer on what I'm doing when I import stuff? Awesome. So I've got my stateless function. It's a beer component. It takes a beer prop. It's going to return an article with a class name beer. That's probably the thing to remember about the beer component is that it has a class name of beer. 
It's got an H1 with a beer name in it, and then it renders the children, the brewery and the beer style, and passes the props through accordingly. Our brewery component looks like this. It's a, another function. It takes a brewery as props, and then uh, it returns an H2 with class name of brewery this time. So that's the thing to remember about the brewery it, is that it has class name brewery. I need to use an example where it's not so hard to say the word. Brewery is a hard word to say. But I like beer, so. If I'm going to shell a render these components, here's a test that kind of demonstrates what's happening. This isn't really a test that I would write in my code, because all it's really testing is enzyme. But this demonstrates the differences between shallow, render, and mount. I'm importing shallow from enzyme. My test is it renders a beer. I create a beer. It has a name, Mud Puppy Porter. I shallow render my beer component, giving it my beer. And I get a wrapper back. And this wrapper is the thing where I can do all my traversing and looking for elements and interacting with things. In this case, I can do a wrapper.find and give it .beer, and that's going to look for any elements that have a class name of beer on it. I would expect that to have length 1, because that component should be there. The beer was at the top level. I also get access to this contains function on the wrapper, which is pretty nice if I want to look for specific JSX. So in this case, if I want to just say, Instead of trying to define the dot beer, I know it looks like this. It's an H1 with this text in it. I can use wrapper.contains to try to find it, and I'd expect that to be true. Wrapper.contains is useful, but not super useful. The test looks nice, but it gets very quickly difficult to find elements in your component, because wrapper.contains has to match that JSX exactly. So if it's as simple as this, an H1 with a Mud Puppy Porter text in it, that's pretty easy to match. But as soon as you start tacking on class names, and um, you know if you're using CSS and JS, something like that, as soon as you start doing that stuff, it becomes harder to match with wrapper.contains. On the other hand, shallow won't render the brewery. So here's my test. It doesn't shallow render the brewery. And I have a beer that has a name, and this time it has a brewery associated with it. I shallow render my beer component and get a wrapper back. I expect wrapper.find.brewery to have length 0 because it shouldn't be there. I also expect uh, wrapper.contains, h2, class name, brewery, central waters, to not be there. Again, this is just demonstrating that shallow is only rendering that top level component. If I want to render more than, th than the top level, I'm going to use either render or mount. With render, my test looks like this. It's pretty similar to what we saw. I'm importing render from Enzyme. And then my test is it renders a brewery. I have a beer with a name and a brewery. I call render, pass it my beer component, and I get a wrapper back. Now when I do wrapper.find.brewery, I expect that to have length one because it's rendering all of the components in my tree. One thing you might notice is missing from this, though, is wrapper.contains. And wrapper.contains is not available with render, basically because render gives you access to a library called Cheerio under the covers. And so the API that's exposed to you is the Cheerio API. You might have used Cheerio to do uh, some screen scraping or just some general um, DOM traversal in some tests or something like that. Mount looks pretty similar. I'm importing mount from Enzyme. It mounts the brewery. My beer has a name, Mod Puppy Porter, and a brewery, Central Waters. I mount my beer component, and I get wrapper back. Now when I do wrapper.find.brewery, I again expect it to have length one. But this time, I have access to wrapper.contains, so I can write those uh, assertions again. Expect wrapper.contains, H2 class name, brewery, Central Waters to be true. There is another method of testing render that comes from Jest, and it's called snapshot tests. And snapshot tests take a snapshot of the rendered component at a moment in time and store it in a file on your file system. It's basically just the markup that gets emitted by your component. That's the first time you run the test. And then every time after that that you run the test, it generates another file, and it compares them side by side. And if the file looks exactly the same, in your test, you get a passing test. 
if, however, you maybe delete something from the component, your component renders differently now, those files don't match, and you'll get a failing test. It might be that uh, the test broke for, uh, you accidentally deleted something, in which case, this is really helpful. You'll say, oh my gosh, yes, uh, undo that. I didn't mean to do that. I shouldn't have deleted that line. But it also might be that you did it on purpose. Maybe you added another class name to something, or you added another element to the component. In this case, we need a way to say, OK, well, now this is the new right answer. And Jess provides the ability for you to do that. Uh, literally by hitting the U key, it will take the new one and stick it in the file system. So that's now what it's going to compare it to. Here's an example of an, uh, an error message that you get from a failing snapshot test. Again, it's a lot of words, and I'm not going to make you read them. I'll, I'll walk you through it. The green box at the top says, received value does not match stored snapshot one. Noise. The blue box in the middle shows me a diff of what changed in the component. So it used to be an H1, and now it's an H1 with a class name of title. And then the red box at the bottom is my, my snapshot summary. And it says, one snapshot test failed in one test suite. Inspect your code changes or press U to update them. So that's your cue to say, oh, well, I know my test changed, but that was on purpose. So now let's write that all to the file system. Here's an example of a snapshot test. In this case, I'm shallow rendering a component. So my test is a snapshot to beer with shallow. I have a beer, name, brewery. I shallow render my beer component, and I get a wrapper back. The assertion is super simple. Expect wrapper to match snapshot. That's all you have to do. And the first time you run this test, it's going to go store that output in the file. The second time, it's going to generate it again and compare it to the file and keep you in that cycle. When you run this test, you're going to get a snapshot that looks like this. Uh, it doesn't have the shallow comments on the top. I put that there. But it's basically the markup of the component that got rendered. It's got an article with the class name of beer, an H1 with the name of the uh, brewery in it, or uh, I'm sorry, the name of the beer in it, and then a placeholder for the brewery. It doesn't render the brewery. It doesn't actually give you the output of that brewery. But it has to put a placeholder there so that it knows if you put the H1 first or the brewery first. If you were to swap the order of those, even with shallow rendering, you'd get a broken test. If I use render instead of shallow, the output looks a little uh, like this. It's really similar. Um, and the main difference is that now I've got an H2 with class brewery. And it shows me the name of the brewery, Central Waters. If I use mount, the output will look like this. It's kind of a hybrid of the two. I've got placeholders for all the components, the beer component. Uh, but then it actually renders the beer component with an article uh, and an H1. And then I've got a placeholder for the brewery component. And then it actually renders the brewery component with the class name of brewery and the name of the brewery. So the people who really like snapshot tests will argue that the tests are really easy to write. They are. We saw how simple that was. It's literally The assertion is to match snapshot. All you've got to do is set up your component for render and run it. They're easy to fix because Jest provides you that ability to hit the U key and just update all of your tests. And because of that, it speeds up your development because you don't have to spend a lot of time writing these unit tests where you set up complicated scenarios and then do complicated comparisons to make sure that everything re renders correctly. But I don't agree with the speeding up development part because the tests break really, really easily. Literally anything changes in your component tree and you've got a broken test and you have to go figure out if you broke it on purpose or you broke it on accident. And the biggest downside for me for snapshot tests is that they're optimized for the time of writing your tests instead of the time of fixing your tests. You spend a lot of time later when the tests break trying to understand snapshot tests that have failed. And if you think about who you're writing your tests for, 
it's partially you. Like, I, I'm writing these tests so that I understand the code and so that I'm not giving my QA person a, a, a steaming pile of garbage. I want it to do what I want the code to do. But right now, you have all the context in the world. You understand the problem space. It's that poor guy three months from now that comes along and stumbles upon a broken test and is like, I don't know anything about this problem. All I know is I went from passing tests to this giant diff that I don't know what to do with. And you've kind of passed the buck on it because now you need to have more knowledge about a problem that you haven't been working in for several months. So there's a third method that um, my team has used to test render with components, and that pulls in a library called HTML looks like. HTML looks like allows you to specify a template of markup with placeholders for things that your markup should look like. And so pulling in HTML looks like, it would be pretty easy to write a just custom matcher, which just allows you to do. That looks like this. My test is it looks like a beer, and it's got a beer and a name and a brewery. I render the beer, and I get a wrapper back. And now I expect wrapper to look like, and I can give it a string of the markup that I want it to look like. I'm not going to show you the code for this to look like custom matcher. If you're interested in it, you can go to stevenhicks.me slash react-testing, and you can find a link to the source code where I, I write that matcher. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part to me is what the test looks like, because I'm going to do this a thousand times, or a hundred times in my code. And so I could, I could do something like this, expect wrapper to look like, my screen is lying to you right now, because it looks like you get syntax highlighting on this section right here, but that's actually a string. Uh, the reason you're seeing syntax highlighting is the, it's just because of the framework that I'm using to render my slides. It's fooled by the code that I put in this slide. You actually don't get any syntax highlighting in this case. It's just a, a big blob of text, which can be kind of a pain in the butt uh, to, to manage because it just looks like a, a big block of test, text, and you have to figure out what's actually in there. Uh, but one of the things that is in there is this curly braces brewery placeholder. That's my way of saying I don't really care what's here. It could be a component that renders 10,000 lines of, of markup. I don't care. I just need it to be something, and it goes right here. That allows me to write my test so that it's focused on specifically the things that I care about. It would also not be difficult to write this to look like matcher to take a JSX element. My screen is lying to you again uh, in the opposite way. You actually would get syntax highlighting here in your code editor. So here I'm expecting wrapper to look like and now I've actually got a JSX element in there. It's an article with a class name and an H1, and I'm just using this, uh, this custom component I created called a placeholder that just emits those curly braces effectively. So in my opinion, these tests are way easier to read and, and maintain than a lot of the tests that we've looked at for testing render. The only thing that's in your assertion is the markup that you care about. There's a very unfortunate downside, and that is that HTML looks like it's really heavy and it slows down your tests. So this is the kind of thing that if you're going to do it, do it if you've got a lot of, uh, you've, you've got a large component tree and you really want to exclude a lot of stuff from it. Another thing that's an issue with it is that when you extend Jest to use custom matchers, the way that you do it they get hooked up before every single test that runs in your test suite. So if you have 500 tests that are just functions and then 10 tests that are using HTML looks like, that penalty is going to take effect on every single one of those 500 tests. And that totally sucks. It will slow down your test noticeably. So one thing that uh, I've, I've looked at is instead of extending Jest at the start of all my tests, basically just pulling it in to any file where I want to use HTML looks like. And that seems to help, because now I'm only paying that penalty for the tests that need HTML looks like. 
The key is to find the right balance of shallow and render. Hi, Corey. Uh, try them all. Um, I like to move as much stuff out of my components as possible. Get it all into those functions so you can test that stuff in isolation. Because that's gonna make it a lot easier to test your components when you don't have to worry about all that logic. And you also don't have to test that logic without having to worry about rendering your components. And then I kinda do, I like to do a lot of shallow testing um, where I can and maybe some deeper testing just as kinda smoke tests to make sure that everything's playing nicely together. But that might not work for you, so kind of play around with those options and, and see what does and, and, um, and, and see what, what you can make work in your test suite. So the other part of testing components that we wanna talk about is testing interactions. And the key to testing interactions is the simulate function that you get from Enzyme. Simulate does what it sounds like. It lets you simulate an event. So I can do something like this. I can shallow render something and get a wrapper back and then I can wrapper dot find a button and then simulate an event on it. In this case, I'd be simulating a click event. And the second argument is whatever arguments you wanna pass along with that event. So this allows me to do things like when the user clicks on this button, this other panel shows up over here. And that's the scenario I kinda, I kinda wanna talk through here. Here's a component that I might use called a collapse panel. And this is the kind of thing where you would click a button and a panel of text would show up below it and you'd click the button and the panel of text would go away. This is how you would use it. You'd call a collapse panel component and pass in whatever it was that you wanted to render beneath it. Our component might look like this. I export my collapse panel. Collapse panel extends react.component. I have a render function. I return a div with class name collapse panel. Collapse panel is an important thing to remember. And then I have an H1 with an anchor and I have a click handler on that anchor because that's the, the button that I'm gonna click, the link that I'm gonna click that makes everything else show up. I also put a class name on it, in this case, collapse panel toggle. Uh, and that might be for CSS reasons or styling reasons, but it also is a hook for me to grab onto that element in my test. The anchor has a, it renders the title inside of it. And then there's a function that gets called after the H1 called render children. Render children would look like this. If the state of my component is collapsed, then I'm not gonna return anything. I'm not gonna render anything. That's basically how I say when it's in the not collapsed state, I don't wanna see that div. However, if the is collapsed bit is false, then I'm going to go ahead and return a div with a class name of collapse panel content, and it's gonna render this.props.children. The state management side of our component might look like this. We initialize our state object so that is collapsed is true. It's an arbitrary decision I made. I want it to start out collapsed. And then I have a toggle collapse handler that calls into the set state, which takes the previous state and basically flips the value of is collapsed to the opposite. We might write one test to verify the default state, and it would look like this. It is collapsed by default. I shall render collapse panel. I get a, uh, I give it a span, and then that sum contents here is the thing that's gonna show up if I click the button and it expands. And my test says expect wrapper.find collapse panel, that's the top level one, to have length one. And then expect wrapper.find collapse panel content to have length zero because uh, when I fire this thing up, it's collapsed and I shouldn't see that, that other div. To actually interact with it, I'm gonna shallow render my wrapper. Here's my test, it uncollapses after clicking. Shallow render, I get a wrapper. Collapse panel, pass in the span. Now I wrapper.find my collapse panel toggle. Remember that's the link that I put that hook on. And I call simulate pass it click because I want to simulate a click event. And now, because I clicked on, on the, the link, I can expect wrapper.find collapse panel content to have length one. And that's pretty much what you need to know about testing interactions. You might think that there's a third thing in your React app that you want to test, and that's component state. And I'm specifically talking about React set state in this case. I'm not talking about application state like Redux or MobX. Um, there's 
kind of different strategies for testing those things. But components that maintain their own state, you might think, oh, well, I want to make sure that the state gets set properly. But what I've found is that times when you want to test your component state, those things are usually covered by interaction tests. If you think back to the collapse panel example, we had this collapse panel, and it was maintaining its own state using set state. And we could have written tests that tried to hook into the state and see, well, OK, when I click this thing, does it set the state to is collapsed is true? But that's really testing the implementation of that collapse panel. That's testing to make sure that we're calling set state properly instead of what we actually want to test, which is as a consumer of this component, when I click this button, this div shows up. And when I click it again, it goes away. So our mountain climber continues on the journey, and we get to some good practices to talk about. We've got tools, and we know how to use them. But how do we write better tests? It starts with better components. We can write them in a way that makes writing our tests easier. For starters, this might be the third time I've said this, extract complicated things and business logic into functions that you can test in isolation. Write all of your different edge case tests against those functions instead of trying to write them against a component that contains all of those functions. We can decompose our components by responsibility rather than size. Small components do fewer things. I'm definitely guilty of trying to make things really, really small and break them into tiny pieces. But then you end up with a situation like, I want to test this list that has list items in it. And I'm stuck because I made the list item its own component, the list a separate component. And when I want to write a test against list to make sure it's rendering properly, I have no choice but to render it deeply. I can't just use shallow to say, well, this thing is rendering a list of items properly. So you have to kind of think about, what is this component specifically trying to display or deal with? And break your components down that way instead of just saying, well, this thing's about 10 lines longer than I want it to be. What can I pull out and put in a different file? With better components, we can focus on writing better tests. For me, I think it's really important to embrace describe. Organize your tests. Describe the function that you're testing or the component that you're testing. Add a second level of describe to describe the scenarios that you're testing, where you've got common setup for about four or five tests. Don't go more than two or three describes deep, because if you've gone that far, that probably means that your component is doing too much stuff. But don't be afraid to throw a second one in there just to organize stuff. And above all, don't be absolute monsters and declare that you don't want to use describe at all. Because that's how you end up with a situation like this. It's a junk drawer of tests. You go back into the code and you want to figure out, hey, I wonder you know, where are all the off tests? And like two of them are underneath the deck of cards. And one is like stuck to the back of the cassette tape. And one of them is you know, buried underneath that lock. You just can't find where all of your things are. When you have common setup extracted into composable functions so that you can minimize the amount of setup code you have to write in each test. Tests are a lot easier to read when you can identify what makes them unique compared to the other tests. Is anyone uh, familiar with the concept of Chekhov's gun? Do people know what that is? I don't know very much about it. Um, it's an idea that comes from dramatic writing. Uh, there's a, a Russian playwright from around 1900 named Anton Chekhov, and he wrote this thing about writing. He's credited pretty largely with uh, being kind of a, 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 a forefather of modern writing. Remove everything that has no relevance to the story. If you say in the first chapter that there is a rifle hanging on the wall, in the second or third chapter, it absolutely must go off. If it's not going to be fired, it shouldn't be hanging there. I think this is a really important thing to remember when you're writing your tests. 
because a lot of times we end up with tests that look like this. Here's a test where I'm returning invalid. I'm checking to make sure it returns invalid for beers with no ABV. ABV, alcohol by volume. So the thing that makes this test unique is not on line one or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine. It's on either 10 or 11 because I don't know if I lost count. Uh, it's, it's this line right here. Everything above that is noise that distracts you from what your test is actually trying to prove, which is that a beer, any beer, that doesn't have an alcohol by volume should return this value. So this is the kind of thing where you can extract all of that common setup into a function that makes you an everyday, ordinary beer. I wrote a function called make me a beer. It's somewhere else in this test file. If I'm using it across multiple test files, maybe I'll put it in a central place. But make me a beer gives me sensible values, sensible defaults for all of that object. And then I can, on the second line, tell you what makes this test unique compared to the others. If you are going to snapshot things, keep those things small. Snapshotting big things is cumbersome, and it's really easy to get lost looking at a huge diff. Five o'clock on a Friday comes along, and you've got a massive diff, and you're just like, I'm done with this. And you hit the U key, and you just update it. And you forget about it on Monday, and you just broke your test, despite fixing your test. Here's a detail that I didn't really talk a whole lot about, uh, but there's a package that you would want to use if you are snapshotting called enzyme to json And if you don't use that one, there's other similar ones that you could use. But the whole purpose of, of these packages is that when I snapshot a wrapper that I get from Enzyme out of the box, I will get the entire wrapper object serialized. And it's a large object, a large JavaScript object. So using enzyme to JSON allows me to clean up my snapshot files. That's how I end up with these really nice, tidy snapshots. Article, H1 Brewery. It's just the markup. That's it. If you are going to use to look like, as I mentioned, extend jest to use that to look like function sparingly, because it does slow down your test quite a bit. And overall, I think it's important to consider your audience. Again, you're writing your tests right now for you because you want to verify that the system works like you think it works. But you're more writing them for yourself in three months with that super sweet mustache so that you don't have to look at this code and think, I have no idea what any of this is about. And I don't know why this test is failing. I have to go talk to this person who wrote it three months ago. Write your tests in a way so that when they fail in a few months, you can tell immediately why. Optimize for fixing the test instead of writing the test. I want to thank you for your time, all of you. Like I said, this was a super impressive time slot. All the other talks that you could have gone to, you came to mine. I really appreciate it. Again, uh, if you want to get a hold of me, at ppopowitz on Twitter, steven.j.hicks at gmail.com. And stevenhicks.me slash react-testing is where you can get slides, uh, code samples, um, and I think that's about it. I will be here next year, and I hope you will too. Those are the dates for next year. I think it's pretty nice that they plan it all the way that far in advance for us. Thank you. Thank you.